Welcome to everyone. We're just going to take a minute to get started as everyone logs in. We're excited to hear where everybody is from, so please feel free to join in in the chat. If you are uh, participating in the chat function, do remember that it tends to default to panelists only. So please go ahead and select um, that blue toggle switch right next to your chat window. Be sure to um, move it to everyone so that everyone um, joining can hear where you're from as well. So I'm dialing in from Sonoma. And uh, we have a wonderful panel of um, contributors today. I'm very excited for today's conversation. I know that in our first session on carbon, um, everyone wanted to go ahead and talk about farming too. And we promised, don't worry, <laughs> we are having an entire session devoted to farming. And we will even talk today about the connections between um, carbon and regenerative farming, which I'm really quite excited to learn more about myself. Um, as all of you know, this is the third session in a five-part series on the Rooted for Good campaign and the different pillars and commitments that are part of climate action and social responsibility. I'm really excited for today's session in particular because we're going to talk about the health of the soil and the whole idea of thinking in terms of food systems in relation to the soil, which is a relatively new conversation that we all have the chance to be at the forefront of, which is exciting. Just to review briefly our previous sessions, um, we of course started the series with the talk on carbon and had preeminent um, speakers from around the world, which was really thrilling for me, including a representative from the United Nations, which was remarkable. But in that session, one of the key things that we talked about is that we can't manage what we don't measure. And so we, that's an idea that we want to really be keeping forward um, through each of the sessions and really think about how that point is relevant to each of the different talk, topics. And we'll talk about that in relation to soil and soil health a little bit today. In the water session, though, we also um, we talked about how we have to shift from, um, from mere measurement to thinking in terms of interactive systems. And it's a really challenging perspective to take up because we're used to many of these things thinking in terms of, oh, well, we can just measure how much we use on something. But as we move forward in these conversations, thinking about things like health of the soil, the kind of health we're bringing to a vineyard through farming, and then also the health and sustainability of things like water, we have to be thinking of a complex system of interactive factors. And we're going to dig into that idea even more today. The key point that we want to make today, though, is that the move, of, the key move of the conversation is moving from thinking of mere dirt to thinking of loyal soil as a living system itself. And our panel is going to help us really better understand that. I'm really thrilled about that. Before we get started, though, I want to remind us, too, that one of the things that Jackson family has helped create through this, through sponsoring this series is the badge program. And so each of these five master classes is really trying, um, has really been created to help educate all of us in the industry to better understand these specific topics. And so in celebration of that, they have created a unique badge for each session. So as you um, dig into these sessions and learn with and study them alongside each of us as speakers, it's possible to download a badge. I believe they're going to um, link to more information on the badge program um in the chat today and those of us that have been participating in each of the uh, sessions and downloads each of the five badges has the opportunity to contribute a short essay or video on what you've been most inspired by in any of these topics and then at the end of the series two or three people will be selected to fly out to sonoma in spring of 2002 for an immersive program really helping to better understand um, how sustainability happens on the ground, how farming happens on the ground, how these decisions are made, and really get to know um, those questions more intimately. So I'm really excited about that. So do keep that in mind. As we get started with today's session, though, um, I want to go ahead and start by introducing our speakers. I'm, of course, I'm Elaine Chacon Brown. I've been moderating this um, series, and I'm really grateful to Jackson Family Wines for sponsoring this series and trusting me to help create these conversations. They've really been um, quite powerful for me, an incredible opportunity for me to personally learn as well. And I'm grateful for the chance to help advance these conversations. So today we have three incredible speakers um, 
that I've been lucky enough to learn from as well. And beginning with uh, Christina Lascano, who is a um, doctorate in biology and assistant professor of soil ecology and a soil biologist having studied plant biology as well. Christina did um, her PhD work in Spain and then has actually ha done postdoctoral work in Denmark and Calgary was previously an assistant professor at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo and is now in um, a, an assistant professor at UC Davis. Her research um, has been focused on multiple food crops, but now specializes in the role of improving soil health and carbon sequestration in relation to creating quality wine grapes. So I'm pretty excited about being able to bring all of those things together through our conversation today. Um, Jamie Good also has a PhD in plant biology, um, is a well-known British author and wine columnist. His work both in wine journalism through as well as in his blog and um, through his multiple published books have um, all won awards. Jamie is uh, probably one of the most award-winning wine writers um, on the planet. So it's quite um, exciting to have him here today. He's based in London, but act really honestly travels the entire world, has visited um, vineyards throughout the world, including some of the newest and most remote um, wine growing regions in the world. And so really is quite um, up to date on viticulture and uh, it's the various vineyard developments in con growing conditions all over the world. So it can really help develop the detail of um, what's being done in different places and challenges of unique conditions worldwide that way. He's also a respected wine judge and the co-chair of one of the world's most respected wine competitions, the International Wine Challenge. Um, and we have, now Sean, I'm going to ask you to say your full name for me. Sean Kajiwara. Thank you. Uh, Sean Kajiwara is the director of farming for Jackson Family Wines and helps to lead farming efforts in the North Coast, especially coastal vineyards in Sonoma and Mendocino, um, really focusing on helping to identify unique needs for, for those kinds of growing conditions. And importantly for our conversation today, Sean is actually leading the effort for Jackson Family Wines um, transition to regenerative farming. The effort is to actually trans, um, transform all estate vineyards to regenerative farming by 2030. And so we're going to get to really dig into the practical reality of what it takes to pull off such a monumental effort. So I'm, thank you to all three of you for being here today. I'm excited about this conversation. So I wanna get us started with, um, with just really making sure that we all understand what we're talking about. Because the truth is that regenerative farming as an idea and as a focus is actually quite new but in this funny sort of way in, in which the practices used in regenerative farming actually are not new. They've been around for quite a long time, but the perspective brought together and known now as regenerative farming is new. And so we want to make sure we all are on the same page in terms of what this conversation is about and what we're talking about. So Sean, let's go ahead and start with you. Cause I just made this comment that, you know, you have, um, you are leading this commitment that Jackson family has made to convert all estate vineyards to regenerative farming by 2030. So let's just start there. What does that mean? Yeah, so first off, I'll say that, you know, it's a great team effort. Um, I'm really privileged to work alongside a lot of talented individuals at Jackson Family Wines who are passionate about sustainability. Uh, regenerative farming is really looking at each of our vineyards as a whole ecosystem. And so we want that ecosystem to be balanced we want it to be healthy for future generations to come. Uh, my journey with regenerative farming started five years ago when I was taking soil samples in the Russian River. I found that we had a lot of high nematode counts in the soil and nematodes can be bad. They can feed on your vine roots and they can cause your vines to be unhealthy. But there are also lots of good nematodes in the soil as well that actually will feed on the bad nematodes one of the, the options I was given to um, deal with the, the bad nematodes was to apply a chemical to the soil uh, that would have not only killed the bad nematodes, but also the good ones as well. And so I thought to myself, is this the kind of like legacy we're going to leave our children where we keep 
hammering pests with chemicals. And I thought that's not, that's really not the right thing to do. How about we, we take a step back and we take a look at what are our other options out there. And so for me, that was really the first step into regenerative farming. It was uh, seeing if I could, I could promote the, the growth of beneficial microbes and insects in the soil. And maybe I would never get rid of the bad nematodes or some of the bad pests in the soil, but maybe I could balance them out. And so really that's what, that's what we're looking at as a team across Jackson Family Wines. You know, there's so many talented people that I work with in the vineyard and everyone is looking at this, this pretty complex issue. And, uh, and we're trialing so many different ideas out there that are hopefully gonna help, help us build these more balanced and healthy ecosystems. That's great, thank you. Yeah, so that shift of thinking in terms of complex systems and full ecosystems, that's a really key part of what we're talking about today. But Jamie, let's go ahead and um, again, start really basic. Help us understand, you know, something, we, we hear a lot about organic farming, we hear a lot about biodynamic farming. So help us understand why regenerative farming isn't just those two added together. What, is, what are the differences between these different types of farming? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that, you know, I think the key aspect here, which um, Sean's touched on, is this, this idea of thinking of the vineyard as an agro ecosystem. And I think I, I first kind of got switched on to these ideas back um, maybe about 15 years ago when I was a science editor, we used to have high end science meetings and, and I learned all about the, you know, one of the meetings was looking at the interactions between plants and the signaling in plants that occurs when you have, for instance, um, you know, you have a specific species of, 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 you know, herbivore that's eating a plant and the plant then responds by sending these semiochemicals, these signal chemicals that recruit the predators that come and eat the, the things that are, the, the, the things that are munching on them. So it's that this idea that this was incredibly complex ecosystem, uh, trying to understand it, trying to make it work better. And obviously with viticulture, we tend to think, first of all, we think about conventional viticulture and we think a step up from there is sustainable viticulture, whatever that is. But then we think that then there's a natural progression, a journey towards organics, which is the pinnacle. And, and I think that's far too simplistic. Um, I think obviously if you're going to be farming regeneratively, you will be using elements that would fall under organics or sustainable wine growing. But what you're effectively doing is you're, first of all, you're, you're, you're understanding this, you know, you've created this rather unbalanced ecosystem. It's a monoculture because you're looking at the crop plants, you're growing grapes. Um, so you've got vines there. And that's been the focus, I think, naturally of viticulturists. But actually, um, you've got to take a step back and look, well, what we've created this agro ecosystem, how can we make it work better? How can we make it function better? And part of that is just beginning to understand the complexity of what goes on in this, this sort of kingdom underneath our feet, where we've got a, a, an astonishingly complex ecosystem, which we, we've kind of ignored because we haven't been able to measure it. We haven't been able to see it. Uh, and I think the next generation sequencing is kind of opening up an understanding of, of the sorts of microbes that are living there um, and the way they're interacting with plants. And, and piece by piece, we're getting this deeper understanding of the complexities of this, this ecosystem, how you can make it more resilient and how you can effectively farm soils. So I'd say the big difference is, is whereas um, I think most of the, the kind of the approaches to viticulture so far have been focused on the vine, this is an approach where we're focusing on the whole ecosystem and in particular, the large part of it, that underground interaction between the vine roots and all the microbes underneath. Yes, that's great. Thank you. So there's some excited people in the chat asking very long, um, complex questions. And so I'm going to ask you, both Sebastian and Andrew, if you could start directing your questions for the panel to the Q&A window, that will help me be able to better focus on and read those and make sure that they get addressed. Um, everyone, please feel free, though, to chat about the different topics that we're talking about in the chat as well. It's just if you have longer questions, then please direct it to the Q&A, and that way I can make sure they get um, addressed along the way as well. Okay, so Jamie, one of the key things that, that I heard you say there is that farming has tended to focus on the vine itself or whatever specific crop we're addressing, as if that is the central focus. But what we're talking about here is making a shift where we're thinking not only about the vine in its entire ecosystem, 
But what yes. I heard you starting to say is that we're actually moving to thinking in terms of, in a way, it's almost as funny as this sounds. The point is that if our goal is to make quality wine grapes, which of course means farming vines, in a funny way, we're not farming the vines. We're farming this, the ecosystem in which the vines grow, which of course centrally would be the soil. Is that right? Yeah, and I think this is this is the key aspect, and because obviously, it, you know, our natural temptation when we're looking at a vineyard is to think well, we want healthy grapes. Anything, so we'll we'll react to other um, elements of the agro ecosystem only in that they directly impact the grapes. So you might have fungal diseases. What well, we'll spray? And um, what should we spray to defeat the fungal diseases? Um, and and obviously, you know, one of the big problems in viticulture is that that vines lack um, vitis vinifera, which is most of the vines that are grown. Than making wine grapes lack our genes against um, downy mildew and powdery mildew and without our genes I mean, we're not getting into the complexities of of um, plant disease resistance and response to disease without the our genes it's really hard to to create a durable sort of resistance i mean right. you can certainly you can certainly help resistance but I mean, this is part of the reason if you've got a healthy um, agro ecosystem you'll know that there are some that there was some microbial signaling to the roots of the vine that then affects the vine's ability then to respond to disease and, and switches on certain defense pathways and it's incredibly exciting this work um, it's still kind of kind of in the process of understanding you know how what the implications are for viticulture but if you've got a healthy soil that's working well um, you know if you're farming that well then then the, the one of the byproducts is you're going to have uh, far more resilience in your vineyard and especially in the face of climate chaos we we want to have more resilience so so what we're looking at in terms of regenerative farming i think is is a, is giving viticulturists a toolkit so this toolkit involves you know various ways you can um like cover crops or composts or you know various applications you can use or just ways of managing the soil and, and ways sure. of managing what you might think of weeds and everything so this is your toolkit and you right. look at your specific place and then you you've got a toolkit here to to help create this more resilient agro ecosystem to farm the soils to produce a vineyard that really works with fewer inputs and you know this is a lot happier place it's the best sort of sort of monoculture really that we can get well and sean gave such a nice example um you know in his response a minute ago with the idea of um again we're not just farming the vine sean talked about how oh it turned out there was a negative nematoid issue and so now we thought it shifted to thinking about how do i farm the soil to increase overall balance so that the negative nematoids are reduced and the health of the soil is increased so again this idea of we're not just farming the crop we're actually farming the ecosystem on which the crop depends so we're farming the soil uh, but in a way that's not about extraction it's about how do i farm for soil health and so Jamie just mentioned this idea of a toolkit, examples of practices that are relevant are, again, as you mentioned, um, cover crops, compost, various teas. We're familiar with some of these because biodynamics, as an example, talks about many of them. But I know, Sean, you've also incorporated grazing um, and the, bringing back animals. These are all different types of tools that we'll keep talking about along the way. But Christina, you know, we're talking about this idea of, um, again, farming the soil itself, but not for extraction. We've tended to talk about farming as an extractive process. We're farming to extract the crop, to harvest something we want. And the key feature of regenerative farming is we're shifting instead away from farming crops to instead farming soil health. And I, I, I'm trying to make sure people get what a profound shift this is, right? We're not talking about farming crops. We're talking about we will get our crop and increase quality by shifting to instead farming soil health. So help us under, let's start there. What, how do we understand soil health? What, how do we recognize it? What is it? Yeah, so as you mentioned, uh, the most innovative uh, aspect of regenerative uh, ag is that it puts the soil in the place that it deserves in an agricultural system. It's the center, the core of an agricultural system. And so regenerative ag is uh, very focused on preserving soil health. Soil health, uh, it's a kind of a broad concept. Um, the NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, 
of the USDA has defined soil health as that continued capacity of soils to uh, function as vital living ecosystems and to support life, the life of plants, animals, and humans. And so, again, this is a very broad definition, but there's, it emphasizes two really important things. One of them is that soils are alive, which is already very radical compared just to- like, <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's very, very new. Um, and then the second thing is that soils should be able to support life. And, and so this, this involves a radical you know, change in the way we are viewing soils, right? Before we usually thought of soils as inert mediums for plants to grow. And so we got to know a lot about the physical properties of soils, the chemical properties of soils and how to manage them, right? We know how to fix pH, we know how to change you know, the nutrient content of a soil, et cetera, to manage nutrients, but we don't know how to manage that living component of soil. And so what we need now is to learn how we can manage that, right? How can we shift our management practices to support soil life so soils can support life on the planet? Yeah, yeah, it's, well, so, uh, you, you just made an important point, though, that we, we're really knowledgeable about things like measuring soil pH, shifting soil pH. We know how to measure nutrients of the soils to increase um, nitrogen or to compensate for too much magnesium. Like we really have a really good handle on the chemistry of the soil. And even on the question of if the soil's fertile. But both of those are very different than this idea of soil health. So could you help us distinguish between, again, chemistry of the soil or soil fertility or soil nutrients? Soil health is a far more comprehensive notion. So how do any of those other factors play into soil health and how do they differ? Exactly. So the concept of soil health builds on uh, another idea that has been around for already a few years, even decades, which is soil quality. And soil quality defines a series of properties that a soil has that makes it good for a certain purpose. So for example, having a certain fertility, having a certain texture, uh, et cetera, right? So when we talk about soil fertility, we have to think as this as a very static property. It's, it really uh, refers to the amount of uh, nutrients that a soil has at a specific moment and how available they are, and so how they can support crop growth. But soil health is different in the sense that it not only involves the, the amount of nutrients that are in the soil, but the capacity of soil to supply nutrients continuously to the plant. And so that is the shift in focus, right? So we are thinking about how the soil, is going to be able to support these processes that are needed to release nutrients that support plant growth. Because and so all of this goes back to the life and the microorganisms and not just the microorganisms, but everything in the soil food web. As Sean mentioned, there are nematodes that feed on microorganisms and they're going to be regulating microbial activity and all that will result in more or less mineralization of nutrients, et cetera. So to clarify, soil having nutrients in, so there being nutrients in the soil does not mean those nutrients are available for use by plants. And so part of the shift we're talking about is soil health is actually looking at the availability, not just of nutrients, but of the soil to support the life of the plant rather than just what's in the soil that can be measured. Is that right? Right, so soil fertility maybe is like a snapshot in time and soil health refers to the capacity of soil to supply nutrients. So it's a process uh, over time. Right, right, right. So over time rather than, so when we measure soil fertility or soil nutrients, we measure in that moment, but exactly. soil health must be talked about as a process over time. Exactly. Okay, it great. It refers to the amount of organic matter that you have in the soil and uh, the microbial biomass and microbial activity that is going to be in charge of breaking down that organic matter and releasing nutrients continuously. 
Okay, great. Thank you. So one of the Betsy's asking a question, I think it's really important for us to clarify. And um, Jamie, maybe you can actually add to this. Um, Christina might need to add to it as well. So Betsy's asking, you know, how is this different from what biodynamics has been doing all along? Because it doesn't biodynamics talk about the living component of the soil. So why is regenerative farming different than that? I think um, organics and biodynamics obviously have both, you know, have both been a big step in this direction. And certainly there's a lot of emphasis on soil health, um, but you've got practices that are often used in biodynamics and organics, like tillage, for instance, it's very widely used, um, where there's, you know, there's, there, there hasn't been quite the same understanding of, of how to preserve and maintain that sort of soil health. And while biodynamics has been, you know, and I think it's a fantastic way of farming, I think it's, it's, it's not had quite the same insight into, you know, the real understanding that, that regenerative farming is based on this understanding of the, of the sort of the agro ecosystem and the, the life in the soil. Uh, not just these ideas about life, but just really actually seeing what sort of biology is going on under there and then encouraging that and supporting that. My, I take it part of the shift too is um, in regenerative farming, there is also a willingness to measure these things more thoroughly than biodynamics has tended to do. Is that right? Yes. And I think the other thing is, for instance, that, you know, some of the, I, I'm a huge fan of proponent of organics and biodynamics, but there are some things that are, you know, things that aren't terribly scientifically rational. For instance, the the insistence that the only fungicides used are copper and copper-based fungicides and sulfur, elemental sulfur. Um, so there's no scientifically logical reason why those aren't chemicals just the same way as, as systemic fungicides are chemicals. And so, you know, and uh, what, you know, if you're going to combat downy mildew, and this is being slightly controversial, and I'm not trying to bash biodynamics and organics, as I say, but a copper is one of the worst things you can put into your soil in terms of the, the life of the soil. And I know that most people will try not to use much of it, but it's just, this is, this is a sticking point, you know, going forwards in terms of, of soil micro life is that you're doing something that's actually, you know, not ideal for soil life. Right. Okay. So I'm going to remind the audience again, please direct questions to the Q and A if they're meant for the panel, because it's much easier for me to track them. One of the things I want to point out though, in response to Andrew in the chat is that it is possible to practice biodynamics without talking about spirits and fairies. So we should be fair to farmers that do believe in the practices of these different traditions and remember that, right? And so what we're talking about though, in shifting to regenerative farming, we are talking about a more complex system, a more thoroughgoing basis in the soil itself and being willing to measure those things. So Christina, in a minute, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna ask you more about soil ecology, but I wanna pause that for a second because we're starting to get interested in specific practices. So Sean, if I, if I could, um, shift to you, I know that one of the key things that you, changes you've already made is, um, is you've actually eliminated the use of herbicides in, in your farming across the board. And this is now when we're, we're I mean, I'm gonna ask Jamie to talk about this more in a minute as well, but this is an incredible challenge, making that kind of shift from chemical farming, whether the herbicides or organic or systemic or pre-emergent or, or sprayed on applications. The point though is that the herbicides um, either kill entirely or at least reduce what's growing in the part of the soil where it's applied. And so now you've actually made a commitment, you've eliminated herbicide use, but let's be honest about how what a challenging transition that can be. What are some of the challenges that come have come up in making this change and that and what what are some of the things that you've had to do to help make that change yeah so first um you know i was starting to see some resistance uh weed resistance to to herbicides and um you know every year um you know we're spraying these cocktails of herbicides to get rid of to get rid of uh, some of the weeds under the vine and those cocktails to me uh were, were really bad for the soil. There were a lot of uh, pre-emergent herbicides that killed all the seeds in the soil. And, and same thing, you know, with, with that, I, I, I was wondering what is that doing to our soil, like to their soil health? And so five years ago, uh, I took a 150 acre vineyard off of herbicide and uh, just used a, a mechanical under, under the vine cultivator 
um, to take care of the weeds under the vine. And, um, you know, I started with, with one machine and over the next five years, I was able to purchase more and more machines. Now I have a fleet of, of 10 under vine cultivators and I'm able to use those machines on 1500 acres. But it took us a lot of um, time to get used to how to use those machines. Um, you know, not all of our ground is flat uh, where we can just run machines easily over a, a flat surface. A lot of our vineyards, as you know, Elaine, are, are hillsides. And so running some of the machines just took a lot, of, a lot of practice and our tractor drivers needed to become skilled at using these, these cultivators. Um, so yeah, there was a learning curve there uh, when it came to, to machine use. It's such an important point though to make too. I think you're giving a good example of how all of these, all of these practices and choices in the vineyard have to be learned, which means they have to happen over time. And I think sometimes on the media and the trade side, we want people to immediately make a switch when actually we have to recognize farming is seasonal and, and annual. And that means that we must allow for these changes to be happening rather than expect that it's just a yes or no question of if they're being done. And so that's a great example of how it took a learning process and now you've been able to commit to it. But Jamie, you've been a really passionate um, um, advocate. You know, you've been very kind of boldly outspoken against herbicide use of any kind. And I know even a few years ago when the idea of organic herbicides was, was coming out and I was spending time trying to understand what it even meant to have an organic herbicide. I walked a lot of vineyards trying to understand this and you and I talked about that and you, you said, well, it doesn't matter that it's organic, it's an herbicide. So talk us through why, why saying no herbicides is so crucial. I think it's because the key issue is that to, to have soil life, you need to have plants growing it. If you want soil life, plants growing in the soil is what creates a life because plants um, exude from their roots a certain proportion of the photosynthates that they fix. So the, the valuable food resource that they create you know, through photosynthesis you know, up to 20, 30 percent of that could be could be actually deliberately released from the roots into the soil to help feed these communities of, of microbes um, in the rhizosphere. That's the area very close to the actual roots itself. And so when you have plants growing in soil, that increases the soil organic material. Um, it, create, it increases soil life. And if you take out those plants, you do two things. One is you decrease the soil life, but also you, you decrease the soil structure as well. So the soil just tends to be more compact and and um, you lose a lot of that soil structure. So if you see a vineyard that's had, um, you know, herbs, because it's the, the real challenge for organics and the real challenge for farming well is that in the actual vine row, under the vines themselves directly, that's always the bit that's the difficult bit to do. You know, the rest of it, you can, you can just mow if you want to. You, can, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's much easier to reach, but reaching there is, is really complex. And, and, but that's really where you want things to be growing and you want, you want um, life in the soil. So the problem with herbicides is that you're eliminating that life. Therefore, you're going to take a massive hit in terms of the soil micro life because you haven't got those roots in there releasing material into the soil to support those communities of microbes. And you're also missing a trick in terms of the, you know, the beneficial effects of a, you know, your cover crop toolkit. You know, that there's so many things you can do with, with various different cover crops. Uh, that will change what's going on in the soil. So my problem is, you know, I understand that one of the elements of true sustainability is financial sustainability. And, yeah. you know, some, some soils are really hard to manage with mechanical weeding. Um, and so, you know, so some, you know, vit viticulture is a compromise to some extent. There's no perfect solution. There's no template. You have to choose the little compromises you make. So I could understand, I've seen vineyards that are really well managed where they might use herbicide once a year. And then they let things grow the rest of the year. That's just to kind of, that's just giving them a chance to, to, you know, actually do it in a financially sustainable way. But ultimately the goal should be not to use any herbicides. I think they're very problematic and they don't really work with regenerative farming at all because of the, the effect, the knock-on effect of the soil life, not having things growing there. Yeah, so, so again, the key issue with herbicides is it's eliminating life in the soil where the herbicides are used. So this is a great time, Christina, to come back to this point about understanding um, soil biology and soil ecology. So, cause again, this is the crucial 
factor in regenerative farming is thinking about how do we farm the life of the soil. So, so we've mentioned already there's microbial life, but then there's also larger soil biota, I think that's the right word. And so we like nematodes and the idea that they're actually are beneficial nematodes, those are examples of a larger biota, which are part of the ecology of the soil. And then there would, of course, be different mites, other sorts of bugs. But part of the idea here is that we're talking about soil as a food system. And then the crop plant becomes part of that food system rather than the sole focus. So help us help us break that down. Help us, is that right that we can think of it as a food system? And then what does it mean um, yeah. to talk through this? Yeah. So what Jamie just mentioned, it's totally yeah. It's it breaks my heart to see how some farmers think that you know being a good farmer means having your fields clean. Uh, because you're turning your soil into a desert and you're killing your soil slowly. And um, the thing is that when we think about biodiversity and a biodiverse ecosystem, most of the people will immediately think about like the rainforest, you know, colorful birds, um, exotic plants. Nobody thinks about the humble soil where we stepped in, right? Um, but the thing is that soils are among the most diverse ecosystems in earth. And that diversity is important for many reasons, um, not just for supporting crops and crop nutrition and our nutrition, but uh, it is important for planetary health. And there are several global processes that are supported by soils, like uh, water purification um, or the regulation of the composition of our atmosphere. And we'll talk about this later, I think. Um, but the thing is that soils are extremely important and a lot of those functions depend on biota, on the living component of soils. But another thing about soils is that, you know, to study biodiversity, you cannot just bring your binoculars and like observe like you could do in the rainforest, right? So soils are difficult to study and because they are dark, they are underground, uh, they are dense. Um, and most of the things that live in soil are very small. And so for most of the history, we didn't have a clue of what was living there. But now we have uh, molecular techniques like high throughput sequencing of DNA, which is allowing us to understand and like to tap into that biodiversity. And, and so we know that all life kingdoms uh, that exist on earth are represented in soils like from microorganisms like bacteria, um, archaea, fungi, to plants and animals. Uh, we have things of all sizes, shapes and colors, like again, microorganisms, to nematodes, to earthworms, moles, right? Um, and they're also very abundant. And especially in the case of microorganisms, one spoonful of soil has more microbial cells than people on earth. Wow. So we have to think about the significance of all of these. And the thing is that the smaller the soil organism, the less we know about it. So for example, we know we have identified only 1% of the microorganisms that live in, in the soil. So what is the rest doing? What is that 99% doing? And that's something that we need to start to look into. And we, when we think about soil biota, uh, up to now we had this kind of really polarized view, like soil organisms are either bad or good, right? They are either pathogens, and so we are really focused on pesticides and you know fumigants, or on biostimulants, right? Mm -hmm. But the truth is that there is this big mass of soil organisms that are not black or white, they are gray but they're equally important for supporting life in the soil because it is not just the presence of the microorganisms, for example, but it's the interactions and the supporting roles that they might have in the whole story, right? So this is the reason why supporting biodiversity as a whole, it's important and supporting soil life as a whole and keeping the soil alive um, so we need to figure out management strategies that are focused right. on this. Right. Well, and this is 
one of the challenges too is that we're talking about complex systems rather than just oh there's too much of this it's bad there's not enough of that it's good so we have to it's much more difficult i know a point jamie makes quite a lot is really this is farming with critical thinking but you know so one of the things i know sebastian was asking about um, different types of um, farming practices and how we might measure them and i know that We've identified at least seven practices that are relevant to regenerative farming, and I that I believe that you know, Sean, you can clarify that Jackson family is committed to. So we've mentioned, of course, composting, um, cro encouraging crop diversity is actually we should be thinking of that as a farming practice. Um, integration of animals and beneficial insects would count as another one. Thinking in terms of the vineyard as a whole, as a holistic environment. Um, and one of the things that a lot of people are um, also um, in the second session on water, we talked about how we need to maximize um, conservation efforts and habitat preservation alongside farming, that we should be thinking of these in concert with each other, because actually preserving wild lands supports the resiliency of our farming abilities as well. So we have to be integrating that kind of thinking as well. But one of the things that I know a lot of people really want to hear more about is the question of tilling or no tilling. This conversation has been increasing worldwide and a lot of questions have come in about it. And so Sean, I know you've actually already started a study. Um, you know, one of the things that um, we talked about in the press conference at the start of this whole series was that the advantage of a company with the means to do it like Jackson family is that not only that you make a sizable impact by shifting your footprint, but actually part of what Jackson's trying to do is like with this series, for example, is share insight on what resources actually work, what practices actually work. And so you've actually started a study on the question of, okay, if we till these rows versus do not till these rows versus till one road, not till another row. So alternate tilling, essentially. Um, so tell, could you tell us more about that, about that study? And, and then we can dig into the idea of tilling or no tilling and, and the relevance of that in this conversation too. Yeah, we first started that trial uh, back in 2017 at the La Crema Sara Lee Vineyard. And really what we we're thinking was that if we have a permanent cover crop, uh, we can help sequester carbon from the atmosphere in our vineyard soils. And so we thought that there was going to be a great benefit there. But from a practical standpoint and from a vine health standpoint, I wanted to see, you know, how would the tillage affect vine health, you know, in the vineyard? So having a replicated trial like that and seeing, you know, no till versus alternate road till versus full tillage, what was the impact on, on vine health, you know, from a... a morphology standpoint or phenology standpoint, um, and then also from a crop yield standpoint. And, um, you know, over the last four years, there hasn't been much of a difference between, between the three different um, tillage practices. Um, we have been adding compost though to the, to the, um, to the no-till rows. So that probably has a lot to do with um, the health of the vine as well. But um, yeah, we're looking to, to, to take these practices to other vineyards as well. Um, we have to be mindful of the fact though that every vineyard is different and every vineyard has a different soil type. We have different rootstocks and vines planted everywhere. So we need to, to be conscious of, of where we do uh, no-till and full-till or alternate row-till. Um, you know, what's really interesting is is the study that uh, we're going to do with Dr. Lascano over the next five years, which is really looking at how we're affecting the microbial population in the soil, um, especially when it comes to no-till, and also with compost and, and grazing involved in that too. So I think there's still a lot of questions to be answered and a lot of uh, science to be done in the next five years. But um, yeah, I think we're, we're, we're going to learn a lot. Well, and Christina, I know in our conversation previously, you're really excited about this study in particular, because I, I want to emphasize, even if the practices of regenerative farming are well-established, regenerative farming as a perspective is very new, and our understanding of soil health, soil fertility, and, and the effect of these different practices, we we're just starting to gain knowledge on that. 
One of the comments you made, you know, Sean alluded to this just now. So there's the question of tilling. I know you said though studies have shown that um, the benefits of these practices actually takes years to start to show that studies don't seem to show an impact in the first, second or third year, but it does seem to show that by year five, we start to see the benefits. So that's one thing, but you've also mentioned that the idea of these, we actually have been able to demonstrate that these practices are synergistic in the sense that, yes, we can get a benefit from one practice, but we actually get even greater benefit from combining practices more than you would get from measuring one or the other separately and adding them together. So could you talk to us about that idea of synergies and, and why this study that Sean just referenced on tilling or no tilling or alternate tilling is so important? Exactly. So one of the focus on of regenerative ag is the focus of regenerative ag is soil health. So for that purpose, whatever whatever combination of practices works for every different context may be good, right? So and there are studies that have looked at the combination of practices, like for example, cover crops and compost and cover crops and no-till, and they show that the effects of both combined are larger than the effects of the practices separate, right? Cover crops are a wonderful way of harvesting CO2 from the atmosphere and putting that CO2 into the ground, right? So we need to think that the plants are like photosynthesizing, capturing that CO2 and when plants die, that litter, eventually it's going to be consumed by soil microorganisms and turn into soil carbon. And not just that, but it's the plant while it's growing that it's pumping carbon into the soil through the roots. And there's this thing that we call root exudates that are like tiny little droplets mm -hmm. of carbon, right? And they are like sugar for microorganisms. They stimulate microbial activity. This is a way that plants have to communicate with their environment, right? So plants use these so the microorganisms start breaking down organic matter, releasing the nutrients that they need to keep growing, right? So. Cover crops are going to be doing this as they are growing, putting that carbon into the soil, into the microorganisms. This is what some other people have called liquid carbon. And it has been already identified as one of the main mechanisms of carbon sequestration, even more important than that dead plant matter. Um, so it is the, the liquid carbon going into the microorganisms, turning into microbial biomass, that it's probably going to be the largest source of carbon sequester in the soil. So this is already a very revolutionary idea. And the thing is that when we grow cover crops with compost, right? The compost is adding nutrients to the cover crop and therefore promoting the growth of the cover crop even further. So we have seen in studies in vineyards in the central coast that the compost and the cover crop are the, that addition of the, of the compost and increasing rates of compost boosts the growth of the cover crop. So there we see a synergy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the carbon that is sequestered either by cover crops or compost, it's going to be more stable and remain in the soil for longer if the soil is not tilled because tillage disrupts the soil structure and it will break down uh, the soil that has been sequestered already. So there's also a benefit to stacking compost with um, cover crops with no till. Right, the maximum benefit for soil health and organic matter increase and carbon sequestration will be seen with a combination of practices. Okay, so I want to make sure we all caught that point that one of the reasons to be considering till or no till is because tilling changes the structure of the soil. So obviously, like we talked about herbicides that disrupts the life of the soil, tilling also disrupts the life of the soil. But one of the reasons tilling disrupts the life of the soil is because it actually changes the structure of the soil, which that which then affects what can grow there. But we should also mention, and we've alluded to this in previous sessions, we should also mention that as we disrupt the structure of the soil, we're also changing the ability for water retention of the soil. And that, of, that can also impact the temperature of the soil and all these things work together to then impact the life of the soil. 
So again, tilling plays a role in the question of soil structure, the water retention ability of the soil, the temperature of the soil, and thereby also the life of the soil. But, you know, Jamie, I know you're seeing this conversation has just been increasing all over the world and there's lots of different practices. And, and one of the things that so wonderfully can be discussed with you is how, you know, the point is every region in the world has different growing conditions. You, you made this point earlier. And so they're really, you know, as I said, one of the things you've, you've said to me is that regenerative farming is farming with critical thinking. You have to be engaging with your exact place and using your, to your toolbox in a very local way. So we can have these universal ideas of good practices, like thinking holistically, knowing cover crops are good, all these different things, but we can only ever apply them to our specific place. So can you talk to us about how is this conversation moving around the world? What are some changes that you've, you're seeing? What are some standout examples that you've seen too? Well, I think one of the standout examples for me was going to South Africa, to the Swatland, um, back in November 19, just before one of my, um, no, it's, it was my penultimate long haul trip before the whole COVID yeah. thing. Um, and in the Swatland, you're dealing with, a, 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 it's a hot area. Um, water, was, water is an issue there. And I went to see Evan Sade and, and also went to see Chris Molyneux and they've, they've just planted new vineyards there, but they planted these new vineyards um, for them to be resilient with, with uh, bearing in mind sort of regenerative thinking. And so the first thing they did is that, well, it doesn't make sense to have a VSP. Um, or vertical shoot in, position. Where yeah, so, so a big- a, Treated like that. Yeah, so you don't want a big wall of vines in a, in a hot climate where water is an issue because you use a lot, use a lot of water to create the canopy and then that, that canopy, once it's larger, then it involves, you know, more water to keep it going. And then also it, you, you know, when you're dealing with a warm climate, it's, it ends up pumping too much sugar into the grapes, you know, so you've got to, you're making life hard for yourself just by the way it's grown. So what they've grown is they've, they're using, going back to bush vines, um, which tend to have canopies that have one of the advantages is the low water um, use, low water demands for the canopies. They limit their own growth. Um, they provide dappled shade for the grapes, which is ideal. Um, and they're using a lot of mulching, which is quite a nice idea. And I saw this in, um, I saw this in Champagne a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, you think of Champagne, you think of bad viticulture, but it's not. Um, it's viticulture in a challenging, challenging environment. And I was with one of the big houses there. And what they've, they've done is they've started, you know, they've turned six of the hectares of their vineyards into you know, farming regeneratively. And so they they really are experimenting with this. And, you know, one of the approaches they do, which they're doing in the Swatland as well, is, is allowing um, cover crops to grow up quite high. Um, and then rather than um, turning them into the soil, you know, or tilling the soil, they're just um, flattening them. They go through and flatten them. And so that provides a layer of mulch. And that, as yeah. you mentioned, soil temperature, soil temperature in a warm climate is an important thing. You, if, you, if you just have bare soil and it's um, you know, and it's a 40 degree day, the soil temperature is going to be much, much higher. So effectively, you're going to sterilize your soil or top layers anyway. So just this idea of using the mulches and that reduces the water loss as well. And this, all these things, as you say, you know, you've got to, it's a, it's a toolkit that you have and you've got to try and do things and think of the unintended consequences of the sorts of things you might do. You know, it's, it's a really creative act, actually. It's a creative, you know, doing something that's, that's harmonious um, with the agro ecosystem it's like um, into... and go ahead so um i just think it's a it's i, I get I, I find it quite exciting to see people just thinking well, what can i do that's going to make this a resilient vineyard and you know, respect the soil micro life um and you know and how can we how can we do this better and i think no-till until is such a fascinating decision because that all depends where you are i think you know um, whether you can uh, you know, and it's and it's also about understanding, you know, because especially with water, when water is an issue, um, then then people are scared to have anything else growing because the, the competition for water might result in uneconomic yields, for the vine. But then having said that, when you've got stuff growing in the soil, first of all, you're incorporating more organic material into the soil. So it retains water better. And secondly, when it does rain, the rain's going to penetrate the soil because of the soil structure and the fact that things are growing there. And so it's it's. It's about thinking, you know, not simplistically, but thinking, you know, uh, about this, the real complexities and uh, of, of what's going on there. I mean, then, then one discussion we could also have, which I, I think is interesting, is if you're in a region that's arid and relies on irrigation, 
what's the best way to irrigate in terms of the soil life, you know, when you're in a very arid area? Um, that's also a really, you know, difficult question. Yeah, it's, um, but well, and again, it has to be relevant to your local situation, right? But yeah, so one of the th big shifts I have seen is a lot of people moving to no-till and then, you know, mowing, as you mentioned, is one response. And interestingly, over time, what plants continue to grow, in other words, the makeup of your cover crop actually significantly shifts over time through something like mowing, because only those plants that can survive having their heads chopped off, so to speak, continue to grow over time. But also a lot of people, as you mentioned, Jamie, instead of mowing are instead crimping. So they're just simply pushing the cover crop over, but then bringing in animals to graze. And so the combination, um, again, changes the structure of the soil, retains more water in the soil, which is an interesting point because we tend to think of cover crops as competition for water, but actually we retain more water with cover crops when managed in certain ways, and then also lower the soil temperature, which prevents water evaporation. So that's really much more, again, thinking in terms of holistic systems rather than adding one to another, to another, to another. It's, it's fascinating and challenging to think about. But Sean, I know, you know, um, one of the things that keeps coming up too, which we should, um, actually let's address a simpler question first. Um, you know, so Christina, you might be a good person to answer this. Carlos is asking, can you describe when tillage can be named conservation tillage? So I think another way to think about this too might be, is there ever a good reason to till? Would it, you know, when, when would be a good reason to till? I'm not sure if I'm the best person in this panel to answer this, but uh, I know that tillage does this wrapped soil structure. And so in that sense, because structure is so important for infiltration, water holding capacity, even biodiversity, then tillage is it, it's not going to support soil health. Uh, now there's different levels of tillage and maybe Sean can answer more better to this. Um, and what my, advice is to always monitor the changes in the soil. And so you will know how you're shifting soil health by what you're doing. So Federico's asking, and this connects directly to what you just said, what is the best method to evaluate soil vitality and health? So how would we monitor that? As you there, are very, there are different indicators, what we call indicators of soil health. And um, there, you know, you can focus on measuring physical properties of soils, like infiltration rates. And there's, this is a really simple technique. You just take a PVC, you know, ring, uh, kind of um, hammer it into the soil a few inches, and then pour water. And then you'll just measure how, how long it takes for that water to infiltrate, right? And, and so you will see changes depending on how you manage soils. The problem is that the issue of water is a very urgent issue for growers. Mm -hmm. and we have, we're in the middle of a drought right now. Uh, and building soil structure and building soil organic matter takes time. So you won't see changes after one season of using no-till or minimum till or conservation till. This is something that also needs to be kept in mind, that building soil health takes time. Right, so it's a it's very difficult to balance those two challenges at the same right. time. Um, this I, I think is one of the biggest biggest challenges that we have right now. And I, maybe Sean can add a little bit about what he understands as um, conservation tillage or minimum tillage from a farmer perspective. Well, yeah, yeah. I, oh, go I ahead. think from yeah from the farming perspective, you know, we there's some sometimes where we till the the soil till it's like a pulverized dust. You know, and and that's that's what we're trying to stay away from. You know, instead of tilling maybe three passes with the disc in a given season, if we're gonna tell, let's do it just once, you know, or twice with the roller behind it, and try and leave some of those bigger aggregates in the soil. It makes tractor driving a little bit more difficult uh, when you leave those bigger aggregates. But our thought is that we're we're not as disrupt disruptive with the soil if we maybe till one time versus you know three or four times. I want to mention another method that I just uh, remembered um, really quick to test the, the structure of your soil, which is the slakes test. So you basically take a glass jar, 
fill it up with water and then take a shovel and take a bunch of a chunk of soil from your field and dip it in the water and just see how long it takes for that chunk of soil to completely disaggregate right so to if you separate have, into this water to separate yeah. into into particles right if you have good soil structure the chunk of soil will stay as a one one piece right it will not disaggregate with that force of water but if your soil structure is not good it will complete immediately uh, disaggregate into particles so this that's is great because that's something yeah. anybody can do and even so, right in the field they can exactly do yeah this is a really easy way to to look at your structure yeah i think the point um, is though that that we need to you know, really develop our vineyards for the future to, to knowing that we're going to keep our cover crop, right? So, so you know, I have an example of a place where we just developed a few years ago where we planted a very strong rootstock. And normally we probably wouldn't have planted a strong rootstock in that area because the soils are so fertile. But we knew that we didn't want to till. We didn't want to do under the vine cultivation and we didn't want to do um, do any tilling between the, the vine rows. So we planted a very drought resistant rootstock, um, one that um, is very vigorous. And uh, over the last four years, we haven't done anything with tillage. And I think that's what really what we really need to do for the future is try and find more of these uh, drought resistant or you know, vigorous rootstocks that penetrate deep into the soil to mine nutrients and water so that we can maintain that cover crop. It's such a good point too. I'm, and you know, Jamie's example with the Swartland was getting at this too, that with one of the challenges with vineyards is it's a long-term crop. And so we're always farming the vineyard we already, already have. But both of those examples in the Swartland and, and um, Sean, your example here in Sonoma was, uh, Yes, and when we develop new vineyards, we can develop them with regenerative farming and the demands of that in mind. And so I take it to that as we shift our thinking on rootstock, that changes, suddenly cover crops are no longer thought of as competition if we have deeper roots. But that also changes, I take it, how we think about irrigation. One of the questions that's come in is just, you know, in terms of regenerative farming, how does that connect to, um, you know, is it possible to move irrigated vineyards into dry farming, even in places experiencing drought? And, you know, Sean, you've been leading um, some shifts in how you think about irrigation there. Do you want to comment on that further? Yeah, you know, when I first started farming, um, it was typical that we would just turn on the irrigation for four hours a week um, during the growing season. And, you know, that got us through the year. Um, we had healthy vines. But um, with the drought conversation, you know, I decided to place some, some deeper moisture probes into our soil. So rather than just looking in the top two or three feet, I put moisture probes that were like five or six feet down into the soil profile. And I wanted to see if we could um, change our mindset around irrigation and, um, and mainly, uh, you know, do these longer irrigation sets. So irrigation sets that were maybe eight hours long, but less frequent because I wanted the water to get down deep into that soil profile so that we could grow our roots deeper into the soil. So that was a, that's something that's ongoing and we're experimenting with, um, with some of these longer irrigation sets, but less irrigations. And of course, in, in wet years, like in like two, 2017, for example, um, you know, we didn't have to irrigate our vineyard at all in some areas because our moisture probes are telling us that, you know, we were right in that, the happy zone um, for the plant. And so, yeah, there are years where we don't have to irrigate at all. Sorry, I can't hear her. Yeah, sorry. I got kicked off Zoom. I don't know if I disappeared to, for all of you, but I actually got kicked off Zoom for a minute, which is terrifying when you're the moderator. <laughs> but I'm I'm here. Okay. So, but Jamie, one of the things that you and I have talked about though too is some sometimes shifting away from something like irrigation is also about changing our expectations of what wine quality or wine expression of a place looks like. It look, Jamie might be frozen. Did you catch that question, Jamie? Yeah, no, I caught that. I caught okay, that. Yeah. Can you talk us through again, again, like if we're shifting away from irrigation or our, or our approach with irrigation, again, Sean was talking about how that affects the root depth, but that can also play into 
the canopy size, it can play into berry size, which then changes the juice to skin ratio, the phenolics. So can you talk us through just that, that idea too, is how it yeah, shifts I, our perspective on wine? No, this, that's a really good question. Before we did that, I just wanted to mention one example I saw that was really interesting. So Central Otago, very dry growing region down in um, at the bottom of South, South Island, New Zealand. And um, one vineyard there has taken a really interesting approach because basically there you pretty much have to irrigate um, um but they've taken the drippers from in the row in the vine row and put them in the middle of the row so they'll make a ridge a little a little ridge down the middle of the row and stick the irrigation pipes down there um, so they're just just below the surface but they're not buried um, and and they just thought it'd be an interesting trial and what it happened is is one of the problems with having a drippers in the row is that you're also encouraging growth of plants where it's hardest to to deal with them. So if you have in the mid row and you get things growing there, then they're, they're kind of easy to deal with. You don't have to go down, you know, because and, and, and the result has been quite interesting. And then also you're encouraging the, the roots of the vines to kind of explore and more of the soil um, profile as well. Um, but in terms of the stylistic points, yeah. Look, this is, this is a, a fascinating question. I think one of the big issues here is that when we're talking about changing agriculture, regenerative farming, biodynamics and organics, um, doing things better. The key thing I think is that that's not just that sm small vineyards, boutique vineyards do this, but we want the, the large vineyards to do this as well. We want the, you know, that's what makes a real difference is the, the where, where, where people are growing for more commercial wines. So, mm -hmm. so cost is obviously a, an, an implication here. And if you're growing, um, you know, if you make a difference on very large vineyards, you're making a, a proper difference. So, so I'm loath to say that that you know stylistically, you, you haven't got much of a latitude. I think for certain segments of the market, you know, the more commercial, um, you know, lower end segments of the market, you haven't got too much latitude to change your wine style. Um, but where you do have some latitude, I think that suddenly um, changing farming is going to go hand in hand, hopefully, with a a, a different approach in terms of what you're trying to achieve with your wine. Um, you know, and hopefully that would go in hand in hand with trying to produce wines that are more interesting, that, that are more authentic, that speak more generally of, of the place that they're grown in in this mysterious way that we, we love when we talk about terroir. But um, just, and just, just that you'd have that same, just as you're having an aesthetic sensibility in the vineyard in terms of taking an agroecological approach and caring about, you know, what the, the life in the vineyard, then maybe hopefully that would be reflected by the approach in the winery as well. And decisions like picking time, and and if we're talking about, um, you know, that that sort of aesthetic sensibility, what I'm getting at is once you go to the winery, don't pick at like 28, 29 bricks, and then have to correct everything, add DAP and thermaid in the winery because your yeasts are going to be struggling because your sugars are too high, and then you have to acidify as well because you, your pH is all over the place. Um, it's like pick at a sensible time, and make wines in a stylistic sense that where where you really are. Um, having to do less it doesn't mean you're less skilled it doesn't mean you're not making it you know you're having to do less because you've got more balance in the vineyard but there's then it's reflected in the grapes then your winemaking right. approach is in some ways carries that over and i, I think this is seeing the whole thing as uh, almost like as a whole it's a way of thinking about wine and it's, it's, maybe it sounds a little bit um, nerdy and geeky but i really think that we're seeing that you know the people who are doing sensible things in the vineyard when you visit them often that they, they will make changes in the winery that that are are much more sensitive they're sympathetic to making wines that that have a connection um with with the place yes is that um, too long lot, no no it's great i um just as a side note very quickly there's a lot of questions that have come in about carbon and carbon sequestration and we're about to get into that but i want to me wanting to make sure we're really addressing the the conversation at hand um before we do that so i mean i think jamie to your point you know that that idea that as we engage, you know, again, farming with critical thinking, right? Actually, the other side of that is being more open minded. And I think as trade and media, you know, Jamie, you and I have talked about this a lot as well, is that, you know, we're, we're demanding our producers to make positive changes. And we need to be more open minded in terms of seeing how does that actually work? And, you know, you made the point, it has to be economically sustainable as well. But now we have to also discover what stylistic changes will it make? 
Sean, are you willing to talk about some of the shifts that have recently happened at La Crema as an example of what Jamie's getting at? I'm sort of putting you on the spot here. Um, but you talked about the, making some harvesting shifts with La Crema. It's just such a great illustration of Jamie's point, I think. Yeah, no, uh, this season, um, I was really happy to, to see La Crema pick a little bit earlier, um, you know, more like at 22 bricks um, and finishing at 24 bricks. And um, I think this year, because of the drought, um, you know, things were just phenolically ripe a lot sooner. And so the picking window seemed to be at a lower bricks. Um, and the acids looked really good as well, too, because we had such a such a, a pleasant, uh, you know, weather during harvest. So yeah, I was really pleased to see that. It's, it's from the farming standpoint, it's nice to see when grapes come into the winery um, and they're not raisins, you know, it, <laughs> yeah. it makes us feel really good. <laughs> it's respecting your work. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I want to make sure we get to a couple of the simpler um, farming questions. You know, Sean, you mentioned shifting rootstocks earlier. Yvonne is asking if you can actually mention what rootstocks in and what kinds of areas, um, you know, what rootstock in what area or vineyard did you use it on and how, did, how it relates to different areas that you're farming? Yeah, so um, just off of Fulton Road, um, you know, we have some of these heavier clay soils. So uh, kind of use, northwestern Sonoma County. For yeah, in here. the Russian River, but in the northern part, um, we used 1103 Paulson and also SO4. And these two rootstocks are doing really well for, for us. Um, I'm also looking at, you know, these other rootstocks like St. George, um, which is something that was used in the past. Um, that's also, you know, puts down a deep taproot. And we even have some, uh, we even have some XR that's still going. You know, mm -hmm. and, and AXR produces a very deep taproot. And so there's there's actually one vineyard called the Arendo Vineyard, uh, which is a Hartford family winery uh, site where we're, we have AXR in the ground. And we're actually gonna, gonna plant more AXR there, um, you know, to fill in some of the missing vines. And so it's really interesting, <clears throat> but, but yeah, in the past we would have used, you know, more of these rootstocks like 101.14 or 420A or Riparia Gloire, and they have their strengths, but really if we're going to go down this path of, of regenerative farming and, and keeping our cover crops, um, we have to look at these strong rootstocks and keep, keep looking at the, the new technology out there. Um, at one vineyard in Anderson Valley um, at the Ed Meads Winery, we're using uh, the GRN rootstocks. There's, I think, three different GRN one, two, and three that was developed by UC Davis. And, you know, those were, were, were kind of proven hard to propagate in the nursery, but we're seeing um, some pretty good results with those rootstocks out in the Anderson Valley. Great. And then another question that's come in specifically about farming, Siobhan is mentioning um, from Portland that, you know, a lot of people I've talked to that have moved to no-till start to see real issues with um large pests like um voles um you know is there do you have comments about how do we manage um no-till and voles who which can like end up girding the vine and then but she's also asking about really large pests like deer or birds so what are some of the efforts in regenerative farming that can be used to address those that larger size pest problem yeah for sure you know, when uh, we see the same thing here, um, we see these, uh, you know, ground squirrels or, or moles um, start, to, start to inhabit the soil without tillage. Um, I would say like you have to put up more raptor perches and owl boxes around your vineyard um, to handle, you know, to try and see if you could handle some of the, you know, maybe if you have too many of those, of those pests in the vineyard. Um, for the most part, when it comes to the big animals, we are uh, putting up a deer fence around the individual box, you know, so not, not fencing in a whole ranch, but, but fencing in just the vineyard itself, um, so that we could have these wildlife corridors that run through the, through the property. That's great. Thank you. Um, so, Christina, I wanted to come back to you, and I think a really crucial question, Betsy has um, beautifully asked about it, and, and it ties into the first session and a lot of questions that came up in relation to carbon. 
So Betsy's saying, you know, there's a debate in the scientific community over the effectiveness of regenerative farming to capture carbon. I know you and you've talked about how it's really still difficult to measure. And so um, Betsy's hoping that you can talk about where we are at with that research and, and the discussion. What's the current perspective in, um, that we should all know in relation to that? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So um, we mentioned before that regenerative farming is actually not innovative in the sense that the practices are not new, but it's the, the combination of practices that there's the, the innovation component to regenerative uh, farming. And there has been a lot of research over the last 20, 30 years on those practices already and uh, no-till, compost use, cover cropping. Um, and now we start to have more uh, research on grazing as well, and specifically in vineyards. And so that, that research shows that the practices work. And we know the practices work to build organic matter, to build soil health, and to sequester carbon. The problem is that um, the studies also show quite a lot of variability. And, and, and what we're starting to understand is that sequestering carbon really depends on environmental factors as well as on soil properties. It's a little bit as like the wine quality, right? It depends on the soil, but also on the rootstock and the grape variety, right? Um, so how much carbon and how much soil health you can build, it depends on that. It depends on the type of soil and where you are and the mm -hmm. climate. Right. So for just, example, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just was going to say, because you, you had mentioned to me that we know cooler, wetter climates sequester exactly. more carbon, whereas if you're very hot and dry, it's actually more difficult to sequester. Exactly. So the temperature and precipitation regulate the composition rates and therefore how much organic matter is going to be broken down in the soil and how much stays. So practices tend to be more efficient in cooler and wetter climates than in um, drier climates. Also practices are more efficient in clay or fine texture soils than in uh, coarse texture soils. Because clays are very reactive, they're sticky and they tend to uh, stick to carbon molecules. And so that will stabilize the carbon much more than in sandy soils. And these are things we need to take into account to design practices that are tailored to those specific conditions. And we need that. We need like a systematic way of evaluating these practices across different conditions, uh, climates and soil types. So we know exactly what to expect. This is extremely important when we are asking growers to transition to these because it's a big effort and growers need to have realistic expectations of what they're going to get. And it's important too for quantifying, right? Especially when you want to get credits in carbon markets. You need to right. know precisely how much carbon you're going to get. Um, and so the literature shows, shows there's potential. We just need to now fine tune and uh, kind of move a little bit into precision regenerative agriculture farming, same as we can fine tune, you know, fertilizers and other types of pra management practices to soils. Now we need to get serious and start fine tuning regenerative practices to each specific condition to get the best out of them. Well, and this connects back to the study with you that Sean mentioned mm -hmm. as well, as, right? So that you'll actually study the effects of regenerative farming, like essentially the whole West Coast and exactly. all the different climate and soil conditions that entire length. Exactly. So we're going to have replicated trials across different vineyards from in a gradient, we call it an edaphoclimatic gradient. So a gradient of soils and climates from Oregon all the way to Santa Barbara. And mm -hmm. so hopefully that will show us how much carbon, how much organic matter we can put into the soil with the same practices in these different places. Another thing that we're going to do is quantify carbon at different depths in the soil, because what we're seeing in the literature is that um, it's the subsoil carbon that might be more relevant for carbon sequestration in the long term. Because normally we measure topsoil, Right, but that's also where most of the microorganisms live and where there is the most activity. The carbon in the subsoil, because there is less microbial biomass and less microbial activity, is going to be 
less decompose for longer time. And so it has pot potentially um, more, it could contribute more to carbon sequestration. Mm -hmm. So we're also going to assess that, how much carbon is sequestered at different depths with these practices. So one of the things that um, you and I talked about as well that connects to a question Annette is asking, so I know the soil's ability to sequester carbon at least correlates with its ability for water retention and also correlates with its ability to, um, to sustain life or have, have soil health. And, and Annette is asking if you can talk through the role of, um, yeah, if you could just describe these connections further. Annette was specifically asking about it in relation to tilling or no tilling. We got into some of that already with the point about soil structure and how that affects these other aspects. But is, do we know, um, can you kind of add to that, fine tune that point about the role of till versus no till and how that affects the soil's ability to sequester carbon and then also the nutrients? That's right. Okay, so most of the management practices we have discussed, cover cropping, compost, no till, what they have in common is that they increase soil organic matter. And soil organic matter is really at the core of soil health. Because organic matter affects soil physical properties, soil chemical properties, and biological properties. It kind of has, it improves soil health in all of those aspects. Organic matter builds soil structure, right? Um, organic matter, it's sticky, and so it binds mineral particles together to build aggregates which form soil structure. Organic matter provo uh, uh, provides uh, cation exchange capacity in the soil, it provides nutrients, so it improves the chemical properties of soils. And organic matter is a food source for the soil biota. So it triggers, uh, increases microbial growth, and it, it generally feeds the food web, right? So it has kind of like a general effect on soil health. So most of these practices are actually focused on increasing soil organic matter. Now, tillage, tillage, uh, what it does is it goes and it breaks down the soil and it accelerates the breakdown of organic matter. And so one of the, this is actually one of the purposes of tilling, like accelerate the breakdown of organic matter so the nutrients are released faster, right? And, and, and that's true. And nutrient availability is going to increase, right? But at the same time that you're doing that, you're promoting the breakdown of carbon and the release of carbon to the atmosphere as mm. CO2 you're breaking the aggregate. So you're destroying the structure of the soil. So there is a very fine balance between how much you can, you know, the benefits and, and the disadvantages of, of tillage. And generally speaking for carbon sequestration, tillage is going to be detrimental uh, for, for keeping the, the carbon in the soil. Okay, so again, it comes back to this point that we have tended to farm thinking about one factor at a time but we instead, we, you know, as Jamie mentioned earlier, we have to think about what are the unintended consequences. So there's a sense in which we have to pause before we make a choice and say, okay, if I till, I'll re release more organic matter or increase the um, breakdown of organic matter, and release more nutrients, but I'll also release more carbon and upset the structure. Where's the bigger benefit? And, and like, think about the balance of the two. Okay. And then, um, so... Justin is also asking, maybe we just briefly, if we could answer kind of the role of fungi in the vineyard in relation to soil life, but also mm -hmm. because can, keeping in mind the concern about fungal diseases, Justin's asking, how can we control fungal diseases without destroying soil fungi? Yeah, that is very tricky. And it's one of the big challenges of sustainable practices, right? Uh, you can't use fumigants. Because fumigants, most of the times, they're not uh, specifically targeting that, you know, microbial species that is damaging your crop, but it's going to damage the whole soil ecosystem. Uh, so you can't use fumigants. So what are you going to do? And so most of the growers that are trying to kind of tackle this challenge right now are doing two things. One of them is focusing on management of soil and cultural strategies. So managing the soil in a way where you're going to improve diversity and therefore reduce the chances for that pathogen to grow. And on the other side, um, work with varieties and crop um, genotypes that are resistant 
to those pathogens. So combining cultural practices with crop genetics is the best strategy to avoid the use of fumigants in soils. Okay, okay, great. I, um, I want to come be sure we come back to um, this question. A lot of people are asking questions that I want to make sure we address. Um, and it's one of the big challenges is that when we're talking, and I think, you know, Christina, your point just now, we've tended to think in terms of, oh, this is the issue we have to address that. This is the issue we have to address that. And we keep them separate. One of the challenges that's come up as we're trying to think about climate change and carbon emissions is that as we're handle, dealing with um, uh, organic farming or under vine clearing, we're radically increasing tractor passes, which then plays into we increase carbon emissions as we apparently are improve our farming. So there's this horrible tension there. You know, Sean, one of the other commitments though that Jackson family has made and that you've, you've been working on is a shift to electric or renewable. So I wanna make sure, you know, multiple companies now have announced electric tractors or rechargeable tractors. And so by 2022, we'll actually see the release of electric tractors, which can be um, recharged through entirely renewable means. And we also are going to see um, the release of electric work trucks. So trucks that actually have the capacity to function as work trucks, but fully electric and, and can be recharged renewable. Sean, do you want to make any other comments, though, just about that challenge of, OK, as we improve our farming practices, in some ways, we actually increase our tractor passes, and then that ends up upsetting our carbon question. Yeah, no, I, I go back to though, you know, how are we going to develop our vineyards of the future? And we, we need to keep that in mind, you know, um, if, if we, if we have the stronger rootstock, maybe we're not needing to go in with the undermine cultivator anymore. Right. And so that right. eliminates uh -huh. that track, those couple of tractor passes. Um, yeah, with the electric tractors, I think um, that's really exciting. I think there's a long way to go. Um, in terms of you know generating enough horsepower for electric tractors to get through the field, also there's a there's a big infrastructure um, you know adjustment or investment that you need to make on your ranches so that you can charge these tractors, charge the batteries. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, progress that still needs to be made in in that area, but it's it's good nonetheless. Um, I'm just really excited too about you know the the 50 sheep that we have um, mm -hmm. at Jackson Family Wines right now, and you know those sheep are um, hopefully going to eliminate um, a tractor pass or two when it comes to mowing, um, and it's also going to help with uh, you know the the issue of compaction because if you're going through the vineyard with your tractor all the time, you're compacting the soil, and that's going to cause issues as well. So. Um, if I if I don't have to run the tractor, you know, a couple of times, and I can I can have the sheep mob graze, and we can move them around the vineyard. That'll be, I think, beneficial for the soil. That's great. This this connects to a question that Aaron's asking too, um, which you know I'd be interested in Jamie's answer on this as well. But starting with you, Sean, you know, you're talking about. And, and again, Jamie's answer earlier, we're about designing our new vineyards with regenerative farming in mind. But Aaron, Aaron is asking, um, you know, to be truly regenerative, should our efforts go instead towards rehabilitating existing vineyards? So again, there's this kind of, we farm what we have, but in some cases we develop with regenerative. So can you talk us through sort of that, that tension? No, we are, we are doing just that. You know, when you plant a vineyard, it's, um... You know, it's at least a 30 year investment or more. And, and we, we find really good quality comes from some of our older vineyards. So we're trying to um, keep those vineyards around for a long time. And, and really with these older vineyards, it just, it just takes in my mind a little bit longer time to get to that point where you're farming regeneratively. So maybe in year one, <clears throat> what you're doing is you're getting rid of herbicide Maybe in year two, then you're then you're diversifying your cover crop, and you're adding compost, and then in year three, you're doing you're doing a little bit more, and then so I would say my recommendation for some of these older vineyards that you want to convert over to regenerative farming is don't try and do it all at once. Like don't try and go all about dynamic or organic all at once. Take your time. Um, make sure that you have the proper equipment. And, and also that you train your people well 
so that um, so that you don't take a step backwards. Because the last thing you want to do is take on too much, and then your vineyard fail, and then you go right. back to your conventional farming. Um, you have to give it a chance. That's great. Yeah. So, make, getting to Aaron's point, work with the vineyards you have, and then when it's time, you can redevelop right. with these. Yeah. So. Uh, Jamie, one of the questions that's coming in um, too is just what are some of the challenges associated with making these um, shifts and trying out regenerative practices, but in more regulated parts of the world? So they're they're naming Europe as an example of an area that has really regulates viticultural practices. Do you have any comments on that? I don't. Yeah, I, I've seen it happen in in you know France and Germany, for instance. You know the, the, these transitions. I don't see a re I don't see a regulatory regulatory of you know objection to any any of this sort of farming i don't think you'll fall foul of any rules right i think so it's perfectly so the regulations are on different aspects of farming rather than yeah. these ones yeah no there'll be like which varieties you can plant and what yields you can take and that those are generally the way the regulations go i don't think the regulations have not made shifting for instance to biodynamics difficult in any um, appellation i know of yeah or to regenerative farming yeah yeah so we're almost out of time. Um, we're actually, I'm trying to be good and keep us to an hour and a half. We're all already about at that mark though. But one of the things I wanna be sure that we mentioned, Christina, cause I have never seen anyone um, talk about it is that, um, well, two points actually. One thing we should clarify is that the possibility of improving carbon sequestration in your vineyard is a local benefit. So we need to clarify, we do want to work on regenerative farming and carbon sequestration, um, but we should recognize that it is a local benefit. It improves the resiliency of your particular site. And one of the things you've emphasized to me is that it is not uh, enough of a solution to combat climate change. We must actually work directly on carbon emissions even as we work on improving the resiliency of our site and its ability to sequester carbon. Did I get that right? So it is a benefit, carbon sequestration in your farming is a benefit for your site. And yet we must also work on eliminating carbon emissions and finding larger scale forms to sequester carbon to combat climate change. Exactly, that's perfect. So okay. sequestering carbon in soils, it can be a solution to, can be an alternative to mitigate part of the emissions. But what we need to do to fix this big crisis we are in is reduce the combustion of fossil fuels. And that's, that's our big problem. Uh, we can help with soil carbon sequestration, but we're not gonna solve it just with right. that. Right. And carbon sequestration has additional benefits that it's increasing soil organic matter that will increase the health of the soil, the sustainability and resilience of the crop against uh, droughts and et cetera. So there are additional benefits um, to carbon sequestration as well. Okay, great. And then the thing that I haven't seen anyone talk about is that um, vineyards or farmland in general can actually be a actually have emissions themselves. And that's the thing I don't see anyone talking about. So we should clarify. My understanding is that um, different types of crops can emit the, the land itself, the actual ground at different parts of the year can emit both methane and nitrous oxide, but mm -hmm. that vineyards actually have far lower rates of emissions than other crops. And yet still there are a few key points growers can keep in mind in order to reduce that sort of emission. So could you talk us through that? That's right. So vineyards are not a problem generally for emissions of greenhouse gases, but agricultural soils can be. And besides CO2, which is a you know, global warming gas, then there is methane and nitrous oxide, which are more potent than CO2 in terms of global warming, and that are released naturally from soils. Uh, the thing is that in agriculture, we can accelerate the release of these gases. Methane is typically not a problem in upland soils because methane is just generated in water saturated soils like wetlands. So rice paddies are going to be a problem, but not vineyards. But nitrous oxide is produced from soils typically when there are high concentrations of available nitrogen. So when we put a bunch of inorganic fertilizers in the soil, ammonium and nitrate, 
and when there is high water content in the soil. Those two factors mainly can trigger the emissions of nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is 300 times more potent than CO2 in terms of global warming. So we need to be careful with those two things, but it's, that's very easy to manage. So just making sure that we don't have a big fertilization event right after you know, a big irrigation event or vice versa, then that will reduce the, the emissions of this greenhouse gas. But so as I mentioned, vineyards are not a big concern because typically we don't have a lot of inorganic nitrogen in the soil in vineyards. That's actually detrimental for, for grape quality. So then that actually lowers the emissions of vineyard soils. We have done studies in California where we actually have seen that it's like rain events that trigger the biggest emissions in, the, in one year as compared to you know, using compost, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so if growers want to be aware of these emissions, what they need to do is just be careful of not combining uh, high amounts of inorganic nitrogen and irrigation at the same time in the soil. Or, or also trying to do it long after a rain event. Exactly. Yeah, okay. And I would say that another thing that I also want to point out is that the literature, the scientific literature shows that regenerative systems that, high, that are diverse and high, have high microbial activity are also able to retain nitrogen much better in the microorganisms. So the nitrogen cycle is tighter than in conventional systems. So there are less losses. Of nitrogen. So this means that regenerative farming in vineyards will decrease the chances of nitrous oxide emissions even further. Okay, great. So we are essentially out of time. I'm going to start wrapping up. One of the things that Aaron has asked is just, you know, what support is, is there for um, the small farmer that wants to farm regeneratively? Um, the USDA is allocating significant funding to climate smart agriculture. There's also subsidies that are available specifically in California for um, regenerative vehicles, electric uh, vehicles, especially tractors. So do keep that in mind. And then also um, the CDFA, I can't remember what that stands for, but it, um, in California, they're um, offering resources, so information as well as funding support for healthy soils programs, so, so small growers can keep that in mind. And then again, Jackson Family has made a public commitment to, as they do these various studies that we've mentioned in, in this particular session, as well as others, they're actually um, sharing their metrics sharing the results of these studies and the effectiveness that they've seen personally. So we can keep that in mind as well. I do need to help us wrap up. So there were a few questions in the Q and A that we were not able to address. So I apologize for that. I was racing doing the best I could. Um, but what I um, would always like to try to end on is just very simple um, answers to what can any of us do? Christina gave us a really nice, um, point about what growers can do in relation to thinking about emissions in the vineyard just now. But, um, but it, I'd like to ask each of you as panelists, what are things that each of us can do to keep in mind, whether from the, you know, as, again, a lot of the audience here today is um, media and trade, but there are some growers um, present as well. So Jamie, speaking to the media or, or members of the trade doing um, sales, either in restaurants or retail, are there recommendations you have for you know, what can they do? What are things you would say to keep in mind when talking about or, or asking questions about these issues? I just think um, what we need to do is we need to get away from this, this sort of three-part hierarchical understanding of viticulture, which is this idea of the, there's conventional, then there's sustainable, then there's organics. And there's a journey that everyone has to take towards organics. And then thinking, well, actually, let's, let's, let's have the most scientifically credible, um, approach the regenerative approach where you're thinking about farming soils let's kind of break out of that that whole framework which we've become a little bit imprisoned by oh thank you sean do you have comments that you'd like to make what are what are recommendations you have for people no i just want to say that um, you know regenerative farming is is really a lifelong endeavor and we have to keep trialing you know new technologies that come out and um, we have to keep learning yeah, thank you. Christina, would you like to give us our final comments for today? I would say that the most important thing is caring about what you do and monitoring what you're doing and, 
and just learning. Yeah, keep an open mind and there's no silver bullet for when it comes to, you know, supporting soil health. That's great. Caring, monitoring and learning. Um, it's a great um, mantra, I think, for any of us in anything we're doing. So thank you for that. Thank you again to all the attendees for being here. It's um, I'm really very grateful to have the opportunity to be helping to create these conversations and share them with everyone. The questions that you ask in the discussion in the chat helps foster the discussion. So thank you very much for that. We'd love to receive your comments as well. So please feel free to send emails to, uh, or share comments directly on social media as well. Um, do remember that the badge for today's session is available and it's a great way to let people know that you've been studying and learning together on these issues and, and also creating the opportunity for you to possibly come to Sonoma next year. Enormous thanks for everyone behind the scenes. These sessions always take a ton of work that is left unseen uh, by attendees. So a huge thanks to the entire um, team, Danielle, Sean, Julian, behind the scenes helping to make this run and um, for all of the prep work that you've done to make this go so smoothly. Thank you to Jackson Family for sponsoring and trusting me to lead these conversations. It's a huge honor and I really hope that all of you are feeling the benefit of, I, I have learned so much personally and um, the commitment to this kind of climate action and social responsibility is of paramount importance to me. And so I hope that all of you too are feeling that it's advancing your understanding and the conversation that you're seeing publicly. So again, thank you to everyone for being here. Thanks most of all to the panel for sharing all of your insights. Um, I've really enjoyed it myself and it's great to see all of you as well. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you.